Objection by the Mimamshika There is only that meditation on the name, etc., as Brahman, but no Brahman. Regarding an image as Vishnu and other gods, and a Brahmana as the Manes and so forth, belongs to the same category. Reply. No, for we are advised to look upon the Rik, him, etc., as the earth, and so on. Here we see only a superimposition on the Rik, etc., of the notions of actually existing things such as the earth. Therefore, on the analogy of that, we conclude that viewing the name, etc., as Brahman and so forth, is based on actually existing Brahman and the rest. This also proves that viewing an image as Vishnu and other gods, and a Brahmana as the Manes and so forth, has a basis in reality. Moreover, a figurative sense depends on a primary one. Since the five fires, for instance, are only figuratively such, they imply the existence of the real fire. Similarly, since the name and other things are Brahman only in a figurative sense, they merely prove that Brahman in a real sense must exist. Besides, matters pertaining to knowledge are akin to those pertaining to rites. That rites, like the new and full moon sacrifices, produce such and such results, and have to be performed in a certain definite way, with their parts following each other in a particular order, is a supersensuous matter beyond the range of our perception and inference, which we nevertheless understand as true solely from the words of the Vedas. Similarly, it stands to reason that entities like the Supreme Self, God, the deities, etc., of which we learn also from the words of the Vedas, as being characterized by the absence of grossness, etc., being beyond hunger and the like, and so on, must be true, for they are equally supersensuous matters. There is no difference between texts relating to knowledge and those relating to rites as regards producing an impression, nor is the impression conveyed by the Vedas regarding the Supreme Self and other entities indefinite or contrary to fact. Objection. Not so, for there is nothing to be done. To be explicit, the ritualistic passages mention an activity which, although relating to supersensuous matters, consists of three parts to be performed. But in the knowledge of the Supreme Self, God, etc., there is no such activity to be performed. Hence, it is not correct to say that both kinds of passages are alike. Reply. Not so, for knowledge is of things that already exist. The activity to which you refer is real, not because it is to be performed, but because it is known through proper testimony, the Vedas. Nor is the notion concerning it real because it relates to something to be performed, but solely because it is conveyed by Vedic sentences. When a thing has been known to be true from the Vedas, a person will perform it, should it admit of being performed, but will not do it if it is not a thing to be done. Objection. If it is not something to be done, then it will cease to have the support of Vedic testimony in the form of sentences. We do not understand how words in a sentence can be construed unless there is something to be done. But if there is something to be done, they are construed as bringing out that idea. A sentence is authoritative when it is devoted to an action, when it says that a certain thing is to be done through such and such means in a particular way. But hundreds of such words denoting the object, means, and method would not make a sentence unless there is one or other of such terms as the following, should do, should be done, is to be done should become, and should be. 
Hence, such entities as the Supreme Self and God have not the support of Vedic testimony in the form of sentences. And if they are denoted by Vedic words instead of sentences, they become the objects of other means of knowledge. Therefore, this, the fact of Brahman being the import of the Vedas, is wrong. Reply. Not so. For we find sentences like, There is Mount Meru, which is of four colors, which relate to things other than an action. Nor has anyone, on hearing such sentences, the idea that Meru and the rest are something to be done. Similarly, in a sentence containing the verb to be, what is there to prevent the construing of its words denoting the Supreme Self, God, etc., as substantives and their qualifying words? Objection. This is not correct, for the knowledge of the Supreme Self, etc., serves no useful purpose like that of Meru and so forth. Reply. Not so. Or the Shruti mentions such results as the knower of Brahman attains the highest, Aitriya Upanishad 2.1.1, and the knot of the heart, intellect, is broken, etc., Mundak Upanishad 2.2.8. We also find the cessation of ignorance and other evils which are the root of relative existence. Besides, since the knowledge of Brahman does not form part of anything else, for example, an action, the results rehearsed about it cannot be a mere eulogy as in the case of the sacrificial ladle. Moreover, it is from the Vedas that we know that a forbidden act produces evil results, and it is not something to be done. A man who is about to do a forbidden act has, on recollecting that it is forbidden, nothing else to do except desisting from it. In fact, prohibitions have just that end in view, that is to say, to create an idea that the acts in question must not be done. When a hungry man who has been chastened by a knowledge of prohibited acts come across something not to be eaten in any way, such as kalanja, the meat of an animal killed with a poisoned weapon, or food coming from a person under a curse, his first notion is that the food can be eaten, but it is checked by the recollection that it is a forbidden food, as one's first notion that one can drink from a mirage is checked by the knowledge of its true nature. When that natural erroneous notion is checked, the dangerous impulse to eat that food is gone. That impulse, being due to an erroneous notion, automatically stops. It does not require an additional effort to stop it. Therefore, prohibitions have just the aim of communicating the real nature of a thing. There is not the least connection of human activity with them. Similarly here also, the injunction on the true nature of the Supreme Self, etc., cannot but have that one aim. And a man who has been chastened by that knowledge knows that his impulses due to an erroneous notion are fraught with danger and those natural impulses automatically stop when their cause, the false notion, has been exploded by the recollection of the true nature of the Supreme Self and the like. Namaste. So this section is an argument from the Mimangsas. And who are the Mimangsas? Well, you know them. Your parents, your teachers, the government. Huh? All the rascal materialists, the scientists, the philosophers, everyone who justifies material existence. And so, how did they try to undermine the authority of the Vedas? By saying that intransitive sentences don't have any meaning. This is the argument in a nutshell. Unless it signifies an action or something to be done, they argue. It's just meaningless, showing an identity or a quality or some other intransitive function. See, normally sentences have a verb, a subject, and an object. So the verb can be either transitive or intransitive. What does it mean? Transitive means the subject is doing something to the object. 
Something is changing. Something is moving. That's why it's called transitive. Huh? But in sentences containing the verb to be, it's called intransitive because there's no action. Nothing to be done. In fact, as Shankaracharya points out, they often indicate something not to be done, like, you know, don't drink the yellow snow. <laughs> so that is not an action. That is a lack of action. Don't do X because it's harmful. It causes evil. Evil means suffering. So the Vedas not only give directions for action in the ritual portions, they also give the meaning of the rituals in the Upanishad portions. So these are not directions for action, or if anything, they're directions for inaction. <laughs> Don't allow your sense organs to be overwhelmed by the objects of the material world. That's the definition of a demon in the allegory in this whole section, the Udgita Brahmana. So don't allow your senses to be overwhelmed by material objects means do focus the attention of the mind and senses on intangible things within which are revealed in the Vedic literatures. That is the existence of Brahman, God, the Devas, huh? Dharma, what is right and what is wrong. These things cannot be understood through sense perception because they're intangible, they're invisible. But the invisible world is just as real. And the proof of that is that if you do these sacrifices and prayers and pujas and sadhanas and so on, you get the results. Maybe not instantly. Huh? It's not like pushing a button on your computer. Duh. It takes some time because you have to change. See, for example, one gets wealth by worshiping Vishnu. But what does worshiping Vishnu mean? It means elaborate, grand ceremonies as described and prescribed in the scriptures. And they have to be carried out for a significant length of time under the direction of a guru, because that's instruction number one, except a guru. In the parampara, the line of disciplic succession of an unchanged purport going back to the beginning. So if one performs this first instruction properly, then more is revealed. And because Vishnu is within, Vishnu is everywhere, Vishnu is a state of being. The, in fact, he is the state of being. Uh, he is the existence potency of Brahman. Sat Shakti. Oh, this is wonderful because that means he's also truthfulness, knowledge, and time. So, by worshipping Vishnu, even though it requires some elaborate preparation, uh, even though it requires some difficult to perform rituals and so on, we still must do it if we desire wealth. Otherwise, we have to work like a dog. See, like for me, I did work, but I only worked when I wanted to work in between visits to India and living in temples and stuff. But still, because I had an honest accountant, she paid my social security taxes without even telling me and just gave me the balance, you know, as my salary or as my, my draw against my earnings, which she was managing and she did a good job. So one day I'm in Chile, South America, creating an ashram up in the mountains this fabulous place. And I get a letter from Social Security saying, hey, congratulations, you're eligible for a pension. What? 
<laughs> so I went online, I checked the records, and sure enough, I qualified for a Social Security pension for the rest of my life, which, if any indications are correct, is going to be quite some time. <laughs> so because I'm performing the Vedic rituals, see, I get health, I get wealth, I get intelligence and knowledge to feed it, and I get happiness, spiritual happiness, that comes from having a relationship with God, in this case, Vishnu, which led to a relationship with Devi, which led to a relationship with Shiva. And now I have to say I'm fully satisfied in all respects. Why? Because I honored the Vedic statements that not only say what to do and how to do it, but also how you should view it, how you should understand it, and that the sacrifices are simply a superimposition on Brahma. So also the meditations, the mantras, sadhana, etc., etc., etc. Everything that we're told to do in the Vedas has no effect or has much less effect if we don't do it with the proper understanding. And the understanding is and that whatever we're worshiping, whatever we're doing, is simply part of our relationship with Brahman, who is ultimately the self. So this is called Vishishta Dvaita Vada. And it is the underlying philosophy of Bhakti, for example, and actually also of Karma Yoga. But in the case of Karma Yoga, there are also direct actions to be performed. But there are also many prohibitions. <laughs> don't do this, don't do that, right? Don't eat meat. Don't belong to any group that worships matter, such as the Mimangshas or the scientists or the mundane religionists, those who are performing Vedic sacrifices for material ends. In this section, they're classified as demons. So don't worship them. Don't even associate with them. And in that way, you get the intelligence to understand the intransitive parts of the Vedas, such as Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. 